Hi everyone and welcome to SC Rewind, a look back at season nine of RIT Sports Zone. Today we'll highlight the major moments on campus and recognize the monumental achievements by our RIT Tigers. But first, Kristen, season nine kicked off with a summer trip to Albany to meet the man who built the RIT football program and who has since become a giant in coaching. This is what life is like for New York Giants head coach Tom Coughlin. A major difference from when he took over the reins at RIT 40 years ago. I came up to RIT, I had the interview with Lou, um, he offered me the job. Uh, so starting a program over with all the details that are involved, you know, I did everything. I did the yeah. travel, I did the equipment buying, we did the everything you could think of with a, with a part-time staff. We yeah. had part-time coaches at the time and I was the only full-time guy. But it was a great move for me. The coach also did the team's laundry and painted the yard markers on the field. But he admits his biggest challenge was filling the roster. <laughs> the challenges really were getting players. I mean, we were recruiting uh, players. You know, I can remember walking into a school, into a high school, and the coach would say, uh, do you want to sit down and look at film? And i say, film. All I want to do is know is who do you have that can qualify to get into a great school like RIT and who can play the game and wants to play at the college level. So I would go to six or seven schools uh, during the course of a day just trying to accumulate numbers. I'd stand out on the, on the walkway over from the dormitories and just look for, for kids. I remember Bruce Kohout walking by and I grabbed Bruce. He was a nice looking big old guy. And asked him if he ever played you know, high school football and he said yes. And so I talked him into into coming out for the, for the varsity team. But there were a lot of guys like that. Now, in your early years at RIT, how did that shape you as a, the coach you are today? Well, I think that the shaping had come a little bit earlier when I played at Syracuse for Ben Schwartzwalder and how Coach Schwartzwalder ran his program. And uh, I thought maybe this is something that I might want to do. And so I would start to think along those lines. And even as a player at Syracuse, I thought along those lines. And uh, so uh, the, the, the style just kind of came naturally because of the experiences that I had. At Syracuse, we were very physical. You know, we ran the ball, we played great defense, and we, we rushed and played from a 5-3 front, and uh, that's where the style began. During his four seasons at RIT, Coughlin didn't field a Division Three powerhouse, but the Tigers held their own, going 16-15-1. I remember playing against great football teams. I mean, we played against a Hobart team that had the two leading rushers in Division Three one time. We tied them. I was real proud of, of, the, uh, of the way in which our players rose from the club level to the varsity level against Alfred and Ithaca and St. Lawrence and Hobart and some really, Brockport, some really good uh, football teams, well manned, well coached, a lot of, a lot of uh, players um, and our guys stood up very well against that competition. The sacrifices those kids made were, were amazing, you know, when you stop and think about the purity of the sport. At that level, there was no one on scholarship. There was really no, no one on aid. Uh, they were there because of the academics of the school and the opportunity to play and, of course, the location. Tom Coughlin took great pride in building a varsity football program at RIT. However, decades later, the Super Bowl winning coach is still disappointed the Tigers program was disbanded. It's, it's disappointing because it is a historical uh, part of, of, the, of our past. and. Uh, certainly would have liked to have seen the program continue. I know that it continued for a couple of years, um, similar to, I guess, what it happened in World War II. I think they had football at a time and then they had to drop it, but uh, it was disappointing. Um, I knew Lou Spiotti was the head football coach at the time when that happened, and uh, I know it, it had to be disappointing for Lou as well. Forty years after starting his coaching career, Coughlin is still at it. The 64-year-old coach is in his seventh season with the New York Giants. Plenty has changed in his profession, but the coach has remained the same and hopes to be remembered fondly when he calls it quits. Lastly, if you had to write the final chapter of your coaching career, how would it end and how would you like to be remembered? <laughs> well, it, I'd like to win the, our, for our team, the New York Giants, to win another Super Bowl. That would be nice. Uh, but I would like to be remembered as a guy who was very thorough uh, very detailed, uh, talked about team exclusively, not about individuals, but about the we rather than the me. Someone who cared about his players, uh, someone who could, uh, you know, who 
learned as he grew in the, in, in the game, just as I think you grow in life in every capacity that you're in, adjusted his style, if you will, to the, uh, to the players and the circumstances of the day. And, uh, you know, and, and, and really got people to play to the best of their ability. That's the, the important thing is that we all, whatever we choose to do in life, that we do it to the best of our ability. And if we can do that, I think then, uh, then uh, it's something that's worthwhile remembering. Welcome back to SC Rewind, a look back at season nine of RIT Sports Zone. It was a year of record breaking performances, and one of the top athletes on campus finished out his remarkable career with another record shattering performance at the pool. Senior Evan Went was named the Empire 8 Diver of the Year and became RIT's first diving All American in three years as he set school records in both the one and three meter events. For the second time in his RIT career, wrestler Mike McAnally finished as the Division III national runner-up. McAnally, who missed last season with a neck injury, went 37-4 in his final season. He leaves RIT with the second most wins in program history at 141. On the diamond, sophomore Brittany Kemp was named the Empire 8 Pitcher of the Year. Kemp had a tremendous season going 5-2 with a 1.78 ERA. She also tossed RIT's first seven inning no hitter since 2003. Pole vaulter Mike Dempsey earned his third All-American honor after finishing fifth at the 2011 Division III Track and Field Championships. Dempsey leaves RIT holding both the indoor and outdoor pole vault records. We're down to one minute remaining. Yo Koyama sends it over to Dag. Dag winds up, scores! Sarah Dag! In women's hockey, senior forward Sarah Dagg was named Division III's Player of the Year. Dagg led the Tigers to a 26-2-2 record in national runner-up honors. She leads RIT as the school's all-time leading scorer with 154 career points. And RIT made the Guinness Book of World Records after holding the largest dodgeball game in history with 2,136 participants. RIT surpassed the University of Alberta's record of 2012. RIT athletes weren't only making headlines for their success on the field, but they also earned recognition for their hard work and dedication within the Rochester community. Since 2007, student athletes and staff members from RIT's library have teamed up to promote the importance of reading in inner city schools. Student athletes and Wallace Center staff members participated in RIT's fourth giant read at Rochester's School No. 5. This is the first event of Read, Hope and Action. Uh, we have 50 athletes and a uh, bunch of library staff here to come and promote going to school and promote reading. Uh, every kid gets a book and uh, they get to keep it. We read it to them and the hope is next year they'll be able to read it back to you. It helps promote reading, which is key in this building, especially this school in particular, where one third of the population are English language learners. That we have a large population of children with special needs, where uh, it's the learning disability, and just all of our children in general. In addition to that, it allows uh, the children to build their own libraries at home because they get an opportunity to, to take the books home. The program was started thanks to the vision and tireless efforts of RIT staff and student athlete Kevin Radigan. Kevin Radigan actually has been a leader for the athletes throughout this whole process. He comes every Friday and he actually had the vision to expand this to all of Rochester. And so he together with uh, Kari Horowitz last year decided to write a grant. Kevin actually identified the uh, John F. Wegman Community Grant and together uh, Kevin Kari and I met with the development office at RIT. Uh, we met with the John F. Wegman Foundation. We wrote the grant and fortunately we got it and today that's funding all of the colleges and universities uh, to be 
here with the kids for our buses, for our books and everything so we could do this today community-wide. This year it was expanded so six other uh, schools, elementary schools, colleges and universities uh, also are doing the same thing at the same time. So I must say as much as I love seeing this for the third year here, I just wish I could be a fly on the wall at the other schools to see what's going on because certainly um, we are doing something phenomenal and it's because of people like Kevin and, and just the whole staff at RIT. What's the future of this program? Well, I know that uh, Kevin and Kari are taking steps right now. Uh, one idea is to expand this to all the schools in the nation that have a tiger for mascot and do a tiger reading day, which would be really fun. And I know Kevin's also trying to make some contacts with the NCAA to talk about expanding this to have a nationwide giant read day where a bunch of college athletes and libraries join together and do this across the country all on one day. Welcome back to Sports Zone. Now, for the second straight year, the RIT men's lacrosse team captured the Empire 8 championship, earning an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. After a thrilling overtime victory over Denison, the Tigers advanced to the quarterfinals to face Amherst. It was a close game early, but RIT would strike five times late to seal it. As Jordan McIntosh scores, he led RIT with five goals. As the Tigers advance to the final four with a 15-10 victory over Amherst. Our second half was big, uh, coming out and we scored five goals there, a 5-0 run, that was big, just kind of put them away. And uh, scoring early on their goalie, their goalie's pretty good, so we uh, made that, made a point to score early and uh, I think we did, a, we did a good job of that. How does it feel to be just one win away from the national championship game? Uh, feels good. You know, I told the guys, you know, you're one win away. You know, if we can, if we can put forth a real good effort on Sunday, um, you know, you're going to the big show and, uh, you know, I, I hope... Uh, they don't get the nervous jitters because of that. I hope they just come out and play a good, clean game and play with confidence. So the Tigers moved on to the national semifinals against defending national champion Tufts. This one went back and forth all afternoon. Tyler Russell brings the Tigers to within one with one of his five goals on the day. But the Jumbos pulled away late. DJ Hessler goes in and beats Bob Tonneson high. Tufts advances with a 16-12 win with more on the end of the Tigers' perfect season. Here's Emily Clark. The RIT men's lacrosse team hosted the reigning champions Tufts University. Hoping to deliver a win, the Tigers' perfect season came to an end with a 16-12 loss to the Tufts. Do you feel like this game was bittersweet? You guys obviously did so well this season. You've made it so far. I don't know. We expected to win this game. Um, we knew it would be close. You know, it wouldn't be... Uh, you know, blow out by any means. They're a great team. They're defending national champs. So, uh, I don't know. We felt like if we showed up, we could definitely beat them. And uh, they just caught us sleeping a couple of times and uh, dug ourselves a little hole. And we couldn't get out of it this time. Uh, yeah, it's things right now. But looking back, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna be happy with what we accomplished. 19-1 uh, and one, and a loss in the final four to the defending national champions is something to hang your hat on. But it's things right now. But I'm sure when we look back, it will be. It'd be impressive. Well, obviously, they're going to the national championship. They're a great team, and when they had opportunities, they capitalized. And uh, you know, both goalies played well. Uh, Could have went either way, if you ask me. What were your expectations going into this season, and do you feel like you met them? Um, I know I don't think we fulfilled our goal. I mean, our goal is to win a national title. So, um, no, I don't think we met our goals. Um, but uh, like I said, a lot of positives to take from it. Uh, we did achieve some of our goals. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think we've got a lot to build on. How does it feel to break the record for the number of goals scored in a single season? Uh, I mean, it feels, feels good for the most part, but I mean, like I said earlier, I'd rather much rather won today. Um, I could have went for zero goals today if we won today. I would have been much more happier. What does it mean to the team to make it this far? Um, thinking back about your former teammate, Willie. Oh, I mean... It's incredible. <laughs> Will, I mean, that kid. That kid was everything, and um, we wore we wore his name on our shirt for a reason this year. And I mean, we know that he was looking over us all year. The guys uh, loved Willie, and uh, 
I think uh, he was with us the whole time. Uh, you know, again, I think he's the big reason why we stuck together all year and, uh, you know, played for each other. Uh, we knew he was with us the whole time. You know, we have him on our sleeves and on our helmet, you know, every game. So we know he's watching over us and, you know, he wanted us to win too, but there's only so much he can do, so. Now you'll be returning next year. So what is something that you hope the team remembers and really brings back for next season? Um, well, I mean, we're going to be graduating a lot of people. Um, but I think a lot of the younger guys who are with us now understand what it takes to, you know, have a successful season. So hopefully, um, hopefully everyone will just come ready to play next year, bring in some new talent, some new freshmen, and hopefully we can make another run like this year. It's going to hurt for a while, but I think, you know, once you start reflecting on things, you know, you're going to, you're going to pick a lot of positives out of the year. Um, you know, the guys didn't quit all the way down to the end. You know, we kept playing and battling and that's what this group's done all year and, and hopefully they've set a precedent. Um, you know, I, th I think last year we started it, but this, these guys really solidified how we want to play ball and uh, what kind of group we are. Welcome back to Sports Zone. For over four decades, RIT Hockey has called Ritter Arena home sweet home, but the days of playing in the cramped yet intimate 2100 seat facility are nearing an end. Last November, RIT alumnus Steve Schultz donated $1 million to the Institute, officially kicking off RIT's campaign to build a new home for hockey. Well, I think part of the excitement is that Steve's an alum. You know, and for us, when we look to who will be potential donors, we often think of those that are remote and maybe not connected to RIT, when in fact, all the people that were here today for the announcement, many of them are alumni. And so I think this is about creating more of a family atmosphere and having one of our own give back is the best. It's the best part of the story. The goal of the campaign is to raise half of the estimated $30 million needed to construct a new facility with RIT covering the remaining cost. A new ice arena is expected to hold between four and 6,000 fans. RIT was well represented in professional hockey this season as former Tigers Jared DeMichael and Dan Ringwald took the ice at the ECHL and AHL levels. But former defenseman Chris Tanev made the biggest jump of all. The rookie became the first Tiger to reach the NHL playing with the Vancouver Canucks. In March, following the end of RIT's hockey season, two more Tigers got the call to the pros. Forward Tyler Brenner inked a deal with the Maple Leafs and was assigned to their AHL team in Toronto, where he scored two goals and added four assists in eight games. And forward Andrew Favitt joined the Elmira Jackals of the ECHL and also contributed with one goal and three assists in six games. Well, once again this year, hockey was the talk of the Brick City, and despite a pair of disappointing finishes, it was a season filled with remarkable achievements for both the men's and women's teams. We wrap up our ninth season of Sports Zone with a look back at the sights and sounds from the hockey season that was. A sold out crowd of over 10,000 people packed the Blue Cross Arena for homecoming weekend, and the Tigers with UMass Lowell delivered an instant classic. Ready to celebrate a victory instead. We're going to head to overtime. An anticlimactic uh, end to this game, John. There's one thing tonight, Johnny, that I think kind of we can put the Frozen Four behind us. Yep. It's a new season here. Everyone's kind of expecting us to get back to Frozen Four this year. I mean, it was a good accomplishment last year, but I think we have to forget about it now. Robert Morris undefeated so far this season. The Tigers. We're going to get their first win as Mitchell coming up the ice. The freshman trying to take it in, goes in, scores! The Tigers win! What has really made this group of seniors so special to you? We came in our freshman year and like we're automatically ranked top 10. And we've been there ever since. I don't think we've been below 7 since our freshman year. We all worked hard for where we are and now we just need to use it and so we can win that championship. The RIT Tigers beat the number one ranked Amherst Lord Jeffs, making the Tigers the team to beat this season with a 10-0 record. I think this will show that we can be a big team two games in a row, even the number one team in the nation, we've done it. And I think it'll just show that we can keep going and we're going to soon do it again and again. Down the ice, the Tigers are going to seal it. 
Great effort, great work. Tigers are 3-0 here. And they're now 9-0 against UConn here. It's home sweet home. Up top, Hartley! Scores! 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 Oh, the Tigers finally get a break tonight. Let's take a look at one of the best traditions here at RIT. The team going over and showing their appreciation to the corner crew. As the Tigers faced off against SUNY Plattsburgh, they did so with a cause. RIT's women's hockey team teamed up with Geneva General Cardiology Association in order to black out heart disease. I'm told this is the biggest crowd to ever watch a women's hockey game in college. For the fourth time in the last five seasons, the RIT men's hockey team won the Atlantic Hockey Association's regular season title, earning the top seed in this year's AHA playoffs. We're excited for the opportunity to defend uh, what we were able to do last year and it's going to be a big uh, big weekend for us and we'll do our best. So the Tigers advance to the ECAC West Final against their biggest rival, Plattsburgh State. Final seconds ticking off the clock and the Tigers hang on and can finally celebrate. They win the ECAC Championship for the first time and earn an automatic bid to the NCAA Tournament. We've been number one. Uh, on the NCAA rankings for quite some time, and we're certainly not going to drop now. Sometimes you can play well and uh, not get rewarded, and uh, I think that was the, the case tonight. I don't think it really hit me how uh, unbelievable last year was until I'm sitting here right now not winning. You know, we're, we've, got, we've got to keep fighting for respect, uh, which I think we keep gaining all the time. It's something you'll never forget. I'm so proud to be a part of it. It's, it's an amazing feeling. RIT advances to the national semifinals easily with a 10-1 victory. They are end up going to advance if the clock ticks down. And there it is, RIT advance. The backhand from 48 in front. Score! Right off the bat. Just a minute 25 into the game. The Norwich University Cadets are your 2011 NCAA Women's Ice Hockey Champions. Obviously, the outcome wasn't the way we planned, but we played right to the buzzer, and I'm proud of our entire team. I couldn't ask for anything more, and it's, uh, you know, I, I've been so happy to watch them play and so pleased to watch them play for four years. This game certainly doesn't define their careers at all. They've done a lot of good things here, a ton of good things.